Hello, I'm Callum O'Shea, partner KPMG in Ireland, and you're very welcome to Business and Finance Executive Insight Series in association with KPMG, where we speak to business leaders about their insights into strategy, success, and overcoming challenges. For today's episode, I'm joined by Imelda Hurley, CEO of Quilta, and winner of the Business Person of the Year 2022 Award. Imelda, you're very welcome, and a huge thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Can I start, if I may, with winning the 2022 Business and Finance Person of the Year and I suppose your recollections of what that felt like. And if you're not too modest, maybe you might tell us a little bit about the characteristics that brought that accolade to you. Absolutely. I'd start by saying it was a huge honour mm. to win the 2022 Business Person of the Year. I was three years into my tenure at Quilta and two of those years had been spent navigating a pandemic mm. and our own mm. industry challenges. And when I reflect on the award and what brought me and indeed Quilta as an organisation and the team at Quilta to that point. I had joined Quilta to bring sustainability to the fore. I had wanted to ensure that Quilta had a very clear purpose and that we would have a new strategic vision for the organisation. And really the combination to my mind of that work, becoming very clear in our purpose and our strategic vision, but with a combined laser focus on day-to-day -day operations and the delivery of strong results really came together as a series of proof points that ultimately helped to deliver the award, which is very much from my perspective, an award for the entire team at Quilta. I was met with an organisation that was hugely ambitious in terms of what Quilta could deliver for Ireland and very much focused on delivering a sustainable future. So our purpose is to manage the state virus on behalf of the people of Ireland. And against the backdrop of climate change and biodiversity loss, we then set about building out a strategic vision for Quilta's forests and lands. Um, we were delighted to launch it in April of 2022. There are 11 ambition statements, but I would summarise them into four maybe mm. key categories for a moment. First of all, we are targeting uh, the creation of new forests, so enabling 100,000 hectares of afforestation between now and 2050, along with capturing an additional 28 million tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere in that period. Secondly, we're very focused on the delivery of sustainable homes, so we're going to continue to deliver sustainably certified timber and we're going to promote the use of that timber. The third thing I would point to is we are going to ensure that we support biodiversity and we're increasing the area of the estate that we will manage for biodiversity on a go forward basis. And finally, we saw a huge increase in footfall on the Quilta estate during the pandemic. And we're very focused now on delivering for people, delivering outstanding new visitor destinations across the estate and indeed delivering more recreation forests. This is a really ambitious vision and I would stand back and say I believe it's rightly ambitious given when you have 7% of Ireland's land under management the responsibility is immense and the responsibility to deliver for the future is equally important. Um, we'll come back to the vision in a moment but I'm interested in some of the challenges that, that, that come with delivering that and I suppose like your CEO of Quilta and a few short months after you start in 2019 Covid comes along and presents a whole myriad of challenges so maybe not just the challenges of Covid but the challenges of, of, of leading an organisation of the complexity of Quilta. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Quilta is an enormous organisation from the point of view of the land base that we manage and that it absolutely means that there are so many different activities taking place across the estate and in our board mills at Medite and Smartply at any point in time and I had given that a lot of thought before I joined in terms of how does one manage in that environment and to me it is very very important that people understand the CEO that they're working with and how I like to operate but also that people understand the autonomy that they have to get on with the job that they are doing. So from the very start, I was very clear in terms of how I would lead. I was very clear that I am a people person and I'm very positive. So I want people to be themselves at work. I want you to spend your energy on doing your job, not trying to be something different mm -hmm. to who you really are. Um, secondly, I am very much in the space of a leader who wants to engage in debate and who believes that diverse teams 
come up with the very best possible answers. So in many ways, I really demonstrated to people that I wanted to learn and we're all going to be learning for the rest of our lives. So in that lifelong learning environment, we're going to listen to each other, we're going to learn from each other and we're going to engage in a debate that will ultimately give us the best possible answers. And the third thing I was very clear with the organisation on is that I'm hardworking, I'm organised and I'm determined in a very good way. So therefore, we really are going to have to work together and set ourselves up for success together. So having outlined those, I suppose, way I would lead or characteristics as to how I was going to go forward, it was very much about engaging with the organisation there are brilliant people across the organisation. Mm. There's deep knowledge in terms of the sector, um, in terms of working with in forestry, working with different communities, working very importantly with the timber industry more broadly. There is so much that we can deliver together. And what I put at the heart of all of that for our colleagues is the relevance of our organisation and the relevance of our sector, particularly as we look to the future. So you're obviously joining a very mature organisation, mm. but I suppose if I focus a little bit on leadership and I suppose you're joining, you know, a high performing senior management mm -hmm. team uh, slotting in amongst them, like how do you, uh, you know, adapt your own leadership style to bring them with you to create that sort of sense of cohesion amongst that team that, you, that you're sort of arriving into uh, and, and, and I suppose brings bear that motivation and that influence on people yeah. to sort of buy into a, a shared strategy together. So you're absolutely right. I joined what was a fantastic and is a fantastic team. So I was clear on five things with my own team and that would then flow down through the organisation. Mm -hmm. I was going to get to know them as business leaders and I was going to work to get to know and understand how they like to work and what worked for them. Um, I was going to work very hard to understand the strategy in place for their division and indeed um, not only their strategy but the operational plans for the year. What has to get done to keep everything moving. Mm. Um, I was thirdly very clear on the fact that I wasn't going to change what wasn't, I use the term broken, but yeah, what yeah. didn't need to change, <coughs> I would not change. Because there can be a history, a new CEO joins an organisation, you've got to be seen to change something. Mm -hmm. And I was clear, well, that won't be me. Um, from there, I was very clear on the fact that you will have freedom as a business leader to run your division. I describe it as very much freedom within a framework will be very clear of what I'm responsible for and what you're responsible for. But I don't like surprises. So I've always been clear that if you think I need to know something, I probably mm -hmm. do. And the last piece, which has been pivotal to how I've led and how we've built a very cohesive team, um, has been the fact that I don't do group think. So I've always been clear that I will challenge uh, yeah. my own team and the organisation more broadly, but I am very comfortable to have my thinking challenged because together we're going to deliver a better outcome than what any of us thinks individually. And speaking of having your thinking challenged, I suppose I look at Quilta as, as a very complex organisation with a whole myriad of stakeholders, many of whom have quite divergent perspectives on a whole range of different things and, and, and you have probably an unenviable task in terms of navigating your way through those different perspectives you know, to, to get that middle ground. Tell us a little bit about some of the challenges of actually navigating those various and many stakeholders that you need to deal with. You're absolutely right. We have a huge number of stakeholders. Mm. We have about 6,000 properties mm. across what we call the estate. And that means we're a neighbour to many and we're in so many communities across Ireland. We also have responsibilities to our shareholders um, and not only the local communities we operate in, but the citizens of Ireland. Because being true to our purpose to manage the state forests on behalf of the people of Ireland mm. really recognises our broad stakeholder base. What's been very important in terms of managing it was developing this new vision, which aligned very clearly with our purpose. And our new vision today is very much around balancing and delivering what we describe as the multiple benefits of forestry. Forests that deliver for climate, for nature, for mm. wood and for people. And I fully acknowledge and respect that some stakeholders will prioritise one of the forestry multiple benefits over another. We see our role as very much to balance and deliver those multiple benefits. And secondly, we very much in the last few years in particular, we've leaned in to the fact that it is important that we consult and that we engage. So we have had two public consultations on our new forestry mm. strategic vision, 
Since we launched it in April of 2022, we've engaged very extensively with stakeholders, shareholders, uh, with political stakeholders, <coughs> and we are always open to engage on a go forward basis. So that is how we work very hard to um, engage with stakeholders mm. and indeed deliver for them. And, and what has that all meant for the organisation? I mean, plot for me a little bit in terms of the changes in the organisation since you joined in 2019 mm. to now. Like, how has the organisation changed in that time? I would say we've, we've changed in, in so many ways. Mm. I'd start first and foremost by saying that if we cast our minds back to 2019, there was engagement on climate change, but not to the extent mm. that there is today. So we've been on that journey ourselves, recognising um, the challenges of climate change and given the lands that we're custodian of, the challenges of biodiversity loss, we've the clarity of purpose coupled with those challenges has meant that a number of things have had to change. First of all, we're consulting a lot more than we ever did in terms of what Quilta's future plans are. Um, not only that, we're driving awareness of Quilta's plans. So we've run, run two full public awareness campaigns and we're just about to run a third in terms of ensuring people understand what Quilta is about. We've taken on a very important role um, to support the promotion of the use of wood in the built environment in Ireland. So that means everything you're hearing now is that Quilt has become significantly more outward looking than we would have been, I would say, years ago. Mm. We've launched our first world-class visitor destination <coughs> beyond the trees Avondale in County Wicklow in the summer of 2022. Mm. And perhaps last, but by no means least, in terms of how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis, we are very focused on the multiple benefits of forestry in our decision making and therefore arguably it's more challenging today to run the business than ever before but they are the types of changes that we've seen directly in Quilta um, which I believe are all to be very welcome. Yeah. I'd also say there are changes that have been driven by the pandemic. We were an essential service during the pandemic um, that meant that people started to ask more questions about Quilta. Why mm. are you an essential service? And that was because timber and wood products and wood processing was all needed to move essential goods around the world. Uh, we were one, or, uh, one of the only organisations in the country that can safely say we saw an intense increase in the footfall of visitors across the estate mm. during the uh, pandemic as people sought to seek refuge in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we very much welcome that. And all of that has meant that we've seen sustained change driven by a range of different factors over the last four years. And we've embraced that change, which is what I believe is most important. And, and I suppose I see you as someone who has long, long championed that sustainability agenda. You've, you've, you've championed ESG for quite a number of times. I've heard you speak a number of times on it. If I broaden it out more broadly than just Quilta, I suppose, tell us a little bit about your philosophy in terms of what you think business in particular needs to do to step up to the challenges of climate change and, and, and play our part in terms of what needs to be done to mitigate the impacts of climate change and, and how we as businesses show leadership in that direction. I suppose particularly organisations like yours that has responsibility for managing land and for productivity. Mm. You're absolutely right. I, I fundamentally believe that sustainability is so important to our future and ESG similarly so. And I am aware that there is you know, plenty debate ongoing about the importance of ESG and perhaps some of it is, is it the right term? In today's world, we have to face the fact that we have challenges ahead in terms of the environment. I think we need very cohesive societies mm. and indeed the governance of how things happen, decisions get made. If I think then very specifically about land production and the forestry sector there are challenges in terms yeah. of how we go forward but there are also wonderful opportunities the first thing i'd say is many climate change solutions will be enabled by land but there's only so much land to go around mm. it's going to be needed for agriculture it's going to be de needed needed to pardon me to deliver wind energy and it's going to be needed to deliver increased afforestation because we know how relevant forestry can be to delivering solutions going forward. We're going to have to make sure that we get that balance right yeah. as we look forward in terms of land use. The second thing I would say, and I'm, I'm often reflective of the phrase that perfection you know, can be the enemy of progress. Mm -hmm. um, and in our own sector, there are often debates around 
productive forests versus broadleaf forests, I believe both are needed. And I think I'd like to take the opportunity to say that we have to think about what is the objective at all times we're trying to achieve in forestry. And based on that objective, what type of tree should we plant and where? So if we are committed to delivering sustainable homes built with wood, which can decarbonize the built environment, then we must embrace productive forestry. We must ensure that we are growing as much of our own wood as possible to ultimately deliver those sustainable homes. And that means softwood conifer forests, which can deliver on that basis. Equally, from a biodiversity point of view, broadly forests are very important. Um, and what I'd say in terms of all of this is, this is the importance of recognising balance, making progress, and actually delivering both types of forestry. So I often reflect on that in yeah. terms of our own sector and the type of challenge uh, that can emerge. And, and lastly, Emel, before we finish up, I mean, your stellar success in your career is, is bound to be something that many, many future leaders are looking at and looking at you as, as a role model, perhaps particularly our, our future female leaders. What advice would you give to, to people who are coming up through in terms of how they might strive for success and how they might target their, their ambitions in the right direction? First of all, I'd say in terms of young people who have an aspiration to be a business leader, more than anything, I would say to focus on what your definition of success is. And I stand back and look at points in my career when I looked at what other people's definition of success was mm -hmm. and really tried to emulate that. I'm very clear now in terms of what I want to deliver as a business leader over my career. And that has really put me at a point where I am so fortunate. I love what I do in Quilta, albeit yeah. it is immensely challenging. <coughs> so I would say to people, figure out what success is to you and follow that path. Building on that, I do think there are certain things that we all need to be clear on, um, either individually or indeed I'd use a business for a moment. It is very, very important that an organisation that you're working for is clear on its purpose. Mm -hmm. Secondly, to be very clear on the business strategy because it is so easy to be so busy with the day to day and make immediate tactical decisions that ultimately get you from A to B, but aren't really strategic in nature. Mm. The third thing I would say is, it's important to have a value set for an organisation. And when organisations are clear on their values, it really sets a series of guardrails by which people interact with each other, mm -hmm. interact with stakeholders, how responsibility is held, and it can be a great mirror to hold up to the organisation and to individuals within the organisation. I would also build on that it is important to build a great team or to be part of a great team mm. because none of us will ever succeed in our own. And what I have seen as I have worked over my career that the best decisions get made by organisations that really have diverse teams that are willing to debate and that are willing to find the best possible path. I welcome debate. It needs to be done in a respectful way and that's where values can absolutely come in. And the last thing I would say is it does take hard work, it takes decisiveness, it takes being organised and it takes being willing to have the courage to make hard decisions to succeed as well. So there's a point I think along a career journey when we can all become more confident because of our experience yeah. and more decisive because we're willing to engage in the debate. That comes with time and there's no substitute for taking that time along, your, along one's career to find that path. Amelda, a huge thank you from all of us for being with us here today and for your candour in, in terms of your, your, your insights. It's really been fascinating. And that's all we have time for in today's episode. So thank you very much, Amelda, for joining us today. And thank you for listening. And you can find more episodes of Executive Insights on businessandfinance.com. Thank you. Thank you.